Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to break with Houston Institute tradition and start on time. Uh, we have such a great crowd, and I'm really pleased to, be, to have you here. My name is David Harris. I'm with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Uh, I want to welcome you on behalf of uh, Dean Manning and Professor Brown Nagin. Uh, today is really a, a special event for us. I, I'm really pleased, and I'm, I'm really glad to see so many people with us. Uh, uh, I have two uh, wonderful people with me today, and uh, you've come to hear uh, Ben talk about uh, these cases. And I just want to, and, and, and our artist in residence and, and, uh, and photographer Lolita uh, Parker Jr. is going to introduce him more fully. Uh, before she does that, though, I want to say that, that I, I first met Ben uh, and kind of came to know of his work through a mutual friend. Uh, and learned of his work and interest in kind of thinking about and documenting uh, cold cases of the civil rights era. And, and I will say, to my mind, he kind of exemplifies uh, uh, the best of uh, investigative journalism. Uh, I, I remember I, I, I found this quote from an email he, he, he wrote to me uh, at the very beginning, and he said... Uh, described his work as, quote, intended where possible to contribute toward prosecutions or other legal redress. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a wonderful goal for a journalist. And, uh, uh, and in this era, I, I have actually been thinking a lot about uh, uh, questions of erasure and questions of voice. And I think, uh, you know, we see it coming up full circle, and Ben might talk about this a bit, a lot, but uh, it's through the work of, of folks like him that we start to uh, actually pay attention and give voice to those uh, who are otherwise ignored. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Lolita Parker, Jr., to give a more full and robust introduction of our speaker. Lolita. As you said, my name is Lolita Parker, Jr., and I've had the honor of being the, one of the uh, house photographers for the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute past 10 years, and that's about the time I met Ben. And I met Ben in, uh, on the Gulf Coast after Katrina. I paid for myself to go down to uh, Louisiana, but ended up in Mississippi because I knew there were more, there, was more, there were more stories than what I was seeing on the news. And so I went down there, and then one dark night in a place called Turkey Creek, Mississippi, I was uh, in a house, it, it must have been midnight, one in the morning, and I was scanning photographs, because one of the things that people lost, you know, in disasters are their photographs, and so I was helping people scan in their photographs that they had left and use my, you know, Photoshop skills to try and re re to bring them back. So Ben came in, and there's two things that happened that night. That was the first time in 2006 that I ever used Google to Google someone who was sitting in front of me. <laughs> and so I could have something to talk about with him. And, you know, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot now, but in 2006 it was a big deal. <laughs> and um, we ended up, uh, uh, he ended up bringing me in on a project he was working on with Dollars and Cents magazine on documenting things that were going on, again, after Katrina. And the one thing I learned from him at the time that was prior to Katrina, that people were still being arrested and jailed for debt. And, uh, you know, you would think, wow, this is 2006, we're in the U.S., there's still debtors prison? But I learned that through Ben, not knowing all the other things that he was up to. So uh, Ben's interest in the civil rights movement was triggered in part by the research into the life of his own father, Paul A. Greenberg, who was a special assistant to the Reverend Martin Luther King at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in the early 60s. Um, for the last decade, he has been publishing independent journalism on unpublished racial violence in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. His work has appeared on NPR Code Switch, USA Today, and in Southern newspapers like the Clarion Ledger and the Aniston Star. Um, ben is a founding member for the Center, the Center for Investigative Reporting's Civil Rights Cold Case. Did I say that right? 
Cold Case Project, and he has written extensively on the February 1964 murder of Clifton Walker and related incidents in southwest Mississippi. Join me in welcoming my friend <laughs> and personal hero, Ben Greenberg. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Uh, thank you, Lolita. You're welcome. Um, it's really an honor to be introduced by you, Lolita. I mean, um, you're a friend, and you've really been a mentor to me, too, Lolita. And um, it's really wonderful that just things have come full circle to us being together at this event like this. So thank you so much. And thank you, David, and to the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for having me. And thank you all for coming. Um, it's really an honor to be here. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about two police homicides of young black men that occurred 52 years and four months apart. In each case, a grand jury ruled the homicides were justifiable and the white police officers never stood trial. On April 9, 1962, Taylorsville, Mississippi police officer William Kelly shot 27-year-old Corporal Roman Duxworth Jr., to death. Duxworth's alleged crime was drunkenness and sleeping on an Adirondack Trailways bus while black. On August 9, 2014, Ferguson, Missouri police officer Darren Wilson shot 18-year-old Michael Brown to death. Brown's alleged crime was stealing two boxes of cigarillos and walking in the middle of the street while black. This talk will mostly dwell on details of these two police killings and on the subject of police brutality. By looking at the two killings together across time, however, I also mean to place them in a broader historical context. Both events are part of a history spanning from the end of Reconstruction to the present, which includes extrajudicial killings of blacks by police, vigilante killings of blacks by white mobs and organized racist groups, and racially motivated killings by individuals. I'm going to start with running through the basic narrative of the killing of Roman Duxworth and, and the responses to it from law enforcement and civil rights groups from 1962 to the present. Then I'll go into a bit more detail about how these responses have shaped current understandings of the case and how those responses have, per, have perpetuated injury to Roman Duxworth's family. Finally, uh, we'll turn to, from there, we'll turn to Michael Brown. In the spring of 1962, Roman Duxworth was stationed in Fort Ritchie, Maryland, where he, where he was serving as a military policeman. Duxworth had only a few months left until military retirement after nearly a decade of service. At 27, he had been in the Army his whole life. Nearly his whole life, not his whole life. Uh, his wife Melva and their five children had lived with Roman on other Army bases. Uh, in Alaska and in Germany, as well as in Maryland, but the kids were growing and the couple wanted to settle down. Roman and Melva built a four-room cottage on Duxworth family land in Cherry Grove, the black part of Taylorsville, uh, where Roman was born and raised. Roman's father, Rome Duxworth, owned hundreds of acres of land uh, in Cherry Grove and was one of only 12 blacks who were, who were registered to vote in Smith County. Melva and the children moved back to Cherry Grove where, where Roman would soon join them after his retirement. In April of 1962, Melba was late in her pregnancy with their sixth child. Roman received word that she was hemorrhaging and needed a blood transfusion and emergency cesarean to save her and the baby. Roman was granted special leave to travel home and be with Melba in the hospital. On the last leg of his 1,000-mile bus ride from Fort Ritchie to Taylorsville, Roman fell asleep. When the bus rolled into town, the bus driver called Tellersville police officer William Kelly onto the bus to remove Duxworth. Kelly, who was white, woke Duxworth and escorted him off the bus. Kelly told Duxworth he was under arrest and directed him to a, to a patrol car across the street. That's when things became violent. Once Duxworth and Kelly were off the bus, they started to tussle, and the police officer drew his gun and fired twice, once into the ground and once through Duxworth's chest. Roman Duxworth Jr. was pronounced dead at the scene. Roman's sister-in-law, Vera Duxworth, and her son, Odell, 
had been at the station to pick him up. Instead, Odell held his uncle in the street as he died. Uh, I'm about to play you a clip from an interview that I conducted with Odell and his brother Lloyd. That's Odell on the right, and Lloyd is on the left. Um, this is uh, just out another town just outside of Taylorsville, um, which is on the um, the the west the eastern side of the state near Laurel. And um, Lloyd, who doesn't really speak in this clip, uh, was born just about the same year as as Roman. So even though it was uncle and nephew, they grew up pretty much as brothers, and, um, but Odell was the one who was there that day to pick up his uncle and uh, instead um, got to hold him as he died. I got there, he was down on the ground, he was mumbling something, I don't know what he was saying, I still think he was trying to tell me something. We'll come back to Odell um, towards the end of the talk um, to learn some more from him about what happened that day. So the crowd dispersed, leaving Odell and Vera to watch over Roman's body until an ambulance from a local black funeral home could get there. Roman died without knowing that Melva had given birth to a healthy baby girl. Less than 24 hours after the slaying, a local grand jury ruled that it was a justifiable homicide. Local officials told military police criminal investigators who were working the case that the grand jury had kept no written records of its proceedings on the shooting and that the Smith County Sheriff made no written reports of its investigation. Eleven days after the slaying, the Justice Department closed its investigation, concluding that it, had, that it had, quote, failed to overturn the claim that Ducksworth was intoxicated and that he attacked Kelly. Three months after the slaying, the U.S. Army Office of the Provost Marshal closed its military police investigation, which concluded that Kelly, quote, lawfully killed Ducksworth. Despite these investigations, and despite one conducted by Medgar Evers for the NAACP, There was never sufficient evidence gathered to establish factual conclusions about what occurred. Judging from the surviving records of these investigations from the time, no physical evidence was collected at the scene of the shooting, no autopsy was performed on Roman Ducksworth, and the site of the shooting was never secured as a possible crime scene. In fact, a critical part of the crime scene, the bus and its witness passengers, was allowed to continue on to Laurel, Mississippi within hours of the shooting, reportedly before Roman, Duck, before Roman Duxworth's body was even removed from the street. The military police investigators, I'm sorry, the military police investigation appears to have been the most comprehensive, but without any physical evidence to consider, conflicting witness statements were the only basis for its conclusion. For its conclusion. In 1989, the Southern Poverty Law Center reexamined the case in order to honor Duxworth with other civil rights martyrs on its Civil Rights Memorial in Montgomery, Alabama. Ducksworth's name is now etched on the black granite fountain near the Law Center headquarters. In 2008, the Department of Justice reopened the case under the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act. The groundbreaking bill sponsored by civil rights hero, U.S. Representative John Lewis, and signed into law in 2008, reopened 113 race-related murder investigations of civil rights workers and ordinary people. At this point, today, more than 100 of the cases have been closed by the Justice Department without prosecutions. Journalists and legal advocates have questioned the Justice Department's seriousness about identifying cases, resolving them, and providing adequate information to victims' families about what happened to their loved ones. 
In 2010, after determining that William Kelly had been dead since 2004, the Justice Department found that the matter, quote, lacks prosecutive merit and closed the case once more. In an effort to nonetheless bring some sense of closure to family members of these victims, the Justice Department has told Congress, the department is writing letters to the next of kin when found. We have also made the decision to have the FBI agents hand deliver these letters to known family members. The goal of the FBI cold case initiative is about much more than justice through the courtroom, explained FBI spokesperson Christopher Allen in a 2012 email statement. It is also about telling the truth to victim families and hopefully bringing about some closure. Thus, over the last weekend of April in 2010, Roman and Melva's eldest son, Cordero, got a phone call from his mother. My mother was in hysterics, Cordero recalled. The gentleman at the door said he was an FBI agent and he was there to let her know what the letter said. And that was it. He said, I'm sorry for your loss, and he drove off. According to our review, wrote a Justice Department official in the letter to Melva Duxworth, once off the bus, Corporal Duxworth struck Officer Kelly repeatedly, and Officer Kelly reacted by striking Corporal Duxworth on the head with a blackjack. Officer Kelly then fired a shot into the ground uh, and a second fatal shot at Corporal Duxworth. As far as the Justice Department was concerned, Duxworth was the aggressor. Kelly beat and shot Duxworth, but only in reaction to Duxworth striking him, quote, repeatedly first. The letter to Melva Duxworth seemed to draw details of what occurred from the 1962 grand jury proceedings that cleared Kelly of wrongdoing. According to the letter, quote, Officer Kelly claimed in the grand jury that he tried to arrest Corporal Duxworth, who resisted. Officer Kelly acknowledged that he struck Corporal Duxworth several times with his blackjack, but claimed that Corporal Duxworth was not affected. According to Officer Kelly, he drew his gun and fired a warning shot into the ground because Corporal Duxworth used a judo strike on him. Officer Kelly claimed further that Corporal Duxworth said something to the effect of, that's no good, and tried to grab Officer Kelly's gun. It was then that Officer Kelly fired the fatal shot at Corporal Duxworth. What was the basis of these findings in the Justice Department letter, which included the assertion that Kelly only fired the fatal shot in apparent self-defense after Duxworth had reached for his gun? As I noted a few minutes ago, the Smith County Grand Jury reportedly told military police that it kept no written records of its April 1962 proceedings. And even if the 1962 FBI somehow learned details of the grand jury proceedings, the Bureau would not have that, would not have that info in 2010. According to, an internal Justice Department, according to an internal Justice Department memo from 2010, when the FBI reopened the case in 2008, it was unable to find its own records from 1962. So um, that's a page from uh, uh, the memo. It's an it's a internal Justice Department uh, procedural memo that's called the Notice to Close File, and it's produced whenever they, there's a case that they are closing after investigation without further action. And it will include a, an overview, like a, an investigative summary of what, was, what investigative actions were taken on the case, and it will include um, as well the legal rationale for closing the case. Um, so you'll see at the bottom of this redacted memo uh, a footnote that says, when the FBI case agents searched the FBI records, they found only a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, request from the Southern Poverty Law Center and the search, for, and, and the search in response to the FOIA request, which reportedly found no records. According to Cordero Duxworth, the family already knew that Kelly was dead. What upset them most was that these official findings seemed to blame Duxworth for his own death. Cordero was five years old when his father was shot to death by William Kelly. So um, this is a page from a Jet Magazine article um, about the funeral of Roman Duxworth. Um, and at top, there's a photo from the funeral. And on the left, the boy you know, on the left-hand corner is Cordero. Um, that's Cordero's aunt, I believe, Vera, um, next to him, and then his mother, uh, the next woman over. Um, and the woman in white is a, um, a, I think they refer to as funeral nurses. Um, 
uh, there to care for, for mourners like Mrs. Ducksworth. It wasn't about the officer, Cordero said. It was about the state and the county saying it's a justified killing. I need for it to be overturned. I don't care if this guy died the day after he shot my father. It's not a justified killing. And that's uh, Cordero uh, re more recently um, with his wife, Michelle. Uh, and they're at an event in Atlanta from uh, five or seven years ago that was put on by um, Syracuse University called Case Justice Initiative um, for families of uh, victims of racial violence from the civil rights era. What do we really know about this case? Most of what authorities and civil rights groups have said about the case can be sourced back to the surviving documentation that is scattered across archives, historical news coverage, and government records. I'm going to ask you to follow me a little ways down the twisty paths of my document research so I can show you just how much bad information law enforcement and civil rights groups have offered as facts about the case. Ultimately, we'll arrive at the specific sources of the Justice Department's 2010 findings that seem to blame Ducksworth for his own death. The Southern Poverty Law Center's literature about the civil rights, mar about the civil rights martyrs commemorated on its civil rights memorial says that Ducksworth, quote, was ordered off a bus by a police officer and shot dead. The police officer may have mistaken Ducksworth for a freedom rider who was testing bus desegregation laws. The physical struggle between Kelly and Ducksworth, Kelly's claim of self-defense and the allegation that Ducksworth reached for Kelly's gun do not figure into the SPLC's sketch of the killing. The SPLC's sources on Ducksworth were NAACP records at the Library of Congress, historical news clippings, and 1989 interviews with Ducksworth family members. The contested details of the shooting itself were fully part of the source were, were, were the contested details of the shooting itself were fully part of these sources that they consulted, but the SPLC chose to emphasize a possible civil rights angle. The suggestion that Ducksworth may have been mistaken for a freedom rider and thus killed goes back then to the NAACP's 1962 justice campaign for the slain black family man and soldier, which I'll talk about now. 60 miles away from Taylorsville, in Jackson, Mississippi, Medgar Evers, pictured there, uh, heard news of the shooting the same night that it happened. Just hours after Ducksworth's body was finally taken from the street where he'd been shot, Evers arrived in Taylorsville to investigate sometime around 2 a.m. By 1962, the 36-year-old trailblazing field secretary for the Mississippi NAACP was a veteran investigator of racial killings. Since 1955, Evers had been fearlessly slipping into communities around the state of Mississippi, often at night and when necessary disguised as a laborer in work clothes to gather information without detection by white supremacists. While Evers was still in Taylorsville talking to the Ducksworth family and others, the NAACP national leadership sprang into action. Executive Secretary Roy, Roy Wilkins sent a telegram to President Kennedy charging that Ducksworth was shot to death, quote, because he insisted on his right to sit where he chose on a bus. Wilkins urged the president, quote, to reassure the public conscience by, by enlisting every appropriate resource at your command to see that Corporal Ducksworth's murderer is brought to justice. Clarence Mitchell, director of the Washington Bureau of the NAACP, got on the phone and called Burke Marshall, U.S. Assistant Attorney General in charge of civil rights. Mitchell followed with a telegram urging prompt action. And on April 12th, President Kennedy's Assistant Special Counsel, Lee C. White, replied by telegram, reassuring Wilkins that, quote, we are immediately asking for a complete report on the incident and will, of course, be in further touch with you. So the stage was set for a national campaign. Ducksworth was military personnel and an interstate traveler, protected under the Interstate Commerce Commission order and the Supreme Court ruling uh, from being subjected to racially segregated seating. The White House was paying attention, and federal authorities would need to respond. On April 13th, the, NAA the NAACP sent a notice from Wilkins to all of its branches around the country. Uh, this is the notice on the screen, and the part highlighted reads, on April 9th, 1962, Corporal Roman Ducksworth was shot and killed by a policeman in Tellersville, Mississippi, because Corporal Ducksworth refused to take a seat in the back of a trailways bus. Wilkins urged association members to wire Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy and their U.S. congressional representatives to ratchet up the pressure for a full federal investigation of the slaying. 
For several weeks, the NAACP kept national attention on the injustice. The protests by the national leadership and by the rank and file members commanded the attention of the highest levels of the Kennedy administration, from the White House to the Department of Justice to the Department of Defense. The 1961 Freedom Rides to end segregation on public interstate buses and, and in restaurants and in waiting rooms in the terminals serving those buses had concluded in, in December of that year, 1961. A November 1st, 1961 Interstate Commerce Commission order forbade segregation on, on interstate buses and required desegregation of interstate bus terminals. But the aftershocks, but the aftershocks from, from the Freedom Rides could be felt everywhere, wrote Raymond Arsenal in his landmark history of the volatile desegregation campaign. Jim Crow signs were removed from across the strait, but, quote, uh, compliance from the ICC order was haphazard at best. Um, and in many Mississippi communities, anyone asserting the constitutional right to equal access to transit facilities risked arrest for breach of peace. The Freedom Rides were an inescapable backdrop to the Roman Ducksworth slaying, but Evers' investigation was not pointing to the conclusions Wilkins and others in the national office were making. In his April 19th special report, Evers wrote that according to the one other black passenger who was on the bus, Mrs. Ossie Ray Brown, Ducksworth was seated across the aisle from her some four or five seats from the rear. By every known witness account, in fact, the two black passengers played it safe and took seats near the back. Then the NAACP, the NAACP documents on the case archived at the Library of Congress do not mention any evidence that Ducksworth had, quote, insisted on his right to sit where he chose on the bus. Kelly's actions attempting to arrest Ducksworth and shooting him dead when he resisted should be outrageous enough for a national justice campaign. Duxworth's life ought to warrant commemoration without the unfounded suggestion that he was a civil rights murder. The problem with this civil rights angle in this particular case is not just that it's incorrect. The problem is that this narrative of racist retaliation for civil rights activism overpowers the imperative to understand what actually happened. Aside from Edgar Evers' investigative efforts in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, no one has acted on this imperative. The question of what happened is different from questions of was the shooting lawful? Was the shooting a violation of federal civil rights statutes? Was the shooting an injustice to campaign around? Or was the shooting a story to memorialize? What I have found with this case and with others is that once the institutional, ideological, or even aesthetic or spiritual purpose of investigation has been fulfilled, the broader purpose of truth-telling falls away. I've been comparing bad investigative findings to what's actually known from witness accounts of the shooting. So let me explain where those accounts come from. Based on 1962 Justice Department memos and on a 1962 Justice Department statement to the press, we know that over the first 11 days following the slaying, the FBI attempted to interview all identifiable passengers on the bus and reportedly gathered accounts from, quote, more than a dozen witnesses, both Negro and white. I've noted that the present-day FBI case agents searched for but could not find the 1962 FBI report containing these witness statements. 1962 news reports and NAACP documents also show that military police criminal investigators conducted a concurrent investigation from April through June of 1962, which included interviewing many, if not all, of the same witnesses as the FBI. The present-day FBI consulted the NAACP records that reference the Defense Department investigation, but the Bureau never sought the report of investigation by military police. I've obtained the 1962 military police report through a Freedom of Information Act request, and that's a page from near the front of it. Um, military police interviewed nine of the 12 passengers, as well as the bus driver, the police officer, William Kelly, terrorist government officials, and other witnesses. The, the passenger statements to the military police provide highly conflicting accounts of what occurred. Some passengers believe Ducksworth was the clear aggressor and that Kelly only acted in self-defense. Others felt Ducksworth was only defending himself against a, senseless, against a senseless beating from Kelly. Others said they could not tell who started fight, the fighting. None of the passengers, however, said that Ducksworth reached for Kelly's gun. Not even Kelly made this claim to the military police. This leaves just one final source that the present-day FBI could have consulted for the findings it delivered to Melba Ducksworth. 
press statements made by local Smith County, Mississippi law enforcement in the days immediately following the slaying. The Jackson Daily News from, from April 12th quoted Smith County Sheriff Ed Martin saying, Kelly fired a warning shot into the ground at the Negro's feet. The Negro said, that's no good, and tried to grab the gun. At that time, Kelly shot him. He didn't know what else to do. I hope you, I don't know if you remember the, the quotation from the letter to Melba Duxworth, but the, the wording is almost lifted from this, from this, news, from this news article. Martin did not witness the shooting. We do not even know whether he was present at the grand jury proceedings, yet his at best hearsay allegations survive as part of the official record of what occurred. So the central findings in the Justice Department's 2010 letter to Melva Duxworth were drawn not from any of the substantive investigations that occurred between 1962 and 2010, but from the hearsay assertions made by the local sheriff who was not an eyewitness and did not conduct a substantive investigation of his own. It was shocking to me to discover what the Justice Department has passed off as a substantive reinvestigation of the Roman Duxworth case. But the failures, but the failures are consistent with ongoing failures of government to protect black Americans from racial killings, whether at the hands of police, vigilantes, or others. In 1877, with the end of Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, Local and state authorities were entrusted with the protection of, of the rights and freedoms of black American citizens alongside those of white citizens. In vicious opposition to black emancipation, whites perpetrated over 4,000 lynchings from 1877 to 1950, according to a recent study by the Equal Justice Initiative. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, the NAACP and others campaigned tirelessly to pass laws and create legal frameworks through litigation to force meaningful federal deterrence and, uh, from and prohibitions on lynchings of black Americans. Congress failed to ever pass an anti-lynching law, and advocates um, have had limited success with litigation. The data on mid-20th century racial killings by police, vigilantes, and others is less comprehensive. Nonetheless, we know that of the 112 other cases besides Duxworth's examined by the Justice Department under the Till Act, almost all have been closed uh, and none have been prosecuted. The Syracuse University School of Law cold case justice. Uh, let's try that again. The Syracuse University School of Law cold case justice initiative discovered an additional 196 suspicious racial homicides from the 1950s and 60s, and submitted them to the Justice Department in 2012. The law school group requested that the, that these cases be added to the to the 113 that the Justice Department began with under the Till Act. The Justice Department added none of them. The Northeastern School of Law's Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project has also investigated scores of racial homicides from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, most of which have not been considered by the present-day Justice Department. After finding that current federal government, after finding that, that current federal government data on police killings was unreliable and incomplete, the Washington Post created a database in 2015 cataloging, cataloging every fatal shooting nationwide by a police officer in the line of duty. In 2015, 2016, and 2017, between 24 and 26 percent of all people killed by police were black, though blacks are just 13 percent of the American population. The names of the responsible police officers are very rarely revealed. In 2015, 99 percent of all police killings did not result in officers being convicted of a crime, according to the Mapping Police Violence Research Collaborative. And Mapping Police Violence has, I think, puts a finer point on, these, on this data. Uh, mapping Police Violence has found further that 27% of U.S. police killings between January 2013 and December 2017 were committed by police departments of the 100 largest U.S. cities. Black people were 39% of people killed by these 100 police departments, despite only being 21% of the population in their jurisdictions. 48% of unarmed people killed by the 100 largest city police departments were black. These police departments killed unarmed black people at a rate four times higher than unarmed white people. The authority to kill blacks without fear of punishment has been a disturbing constant in American life from the end of Reconstruction to the present. U.S. government has consistently failed to protect black Americans from racial killings, whether at the hands of police, vigilantes, or others. 
U.S. criminal justice institutions have done much more to protect the killers than to find justice for their black victims. Responding to the killings of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, and then to the many police killings that have occurred since, Black Lives Matter has greatly increased public awareness of recent vigilante and police killings of black people and of the chronic failures of justice for the victims in their communities. We'll look at the Michael Brown case now against the background of the Roman Duxworth case to see some of the roots of the crisis that is playing out today. Before I explain how Roman Duxworth and Michael Brown's stories first came together in my mind, let's review some of the basics of what's known about the killing of Michael Brown. On August 9th, 2014, at about noon, two young black men, Michael Brown, age 18, and Dorian Johnson, age 22, were walking eastbound in the middle of the road on Canfield Drive in Ferguson, Missouri, a northern suburb of St. Louis. Ferguson is 67% African American and 30% white. Roughly a quarter of Ferguson's residents live below the federal poverty line. At this time, Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson was driving westbound on Canfield Drive in his department-issued Chevy Tahoe SUV. As Wilson approached the two young men, he told them to walk on the sidewalk. According to Wilson, Johnson said, we are almost to our destination. Wilson said he asked them, quote, what's wrong with the sidewalk, and that Brown replied, quote, fuck what you have to say. Just before Wilson encountered Brown and Johnson, he heard a report over the police radio of a, quote, stealing in progress at a nearby convenience store. As he rolled past them, Wilson allegedly observed Brown holding a box of cigarillos, which was what was allegedly stolen from the convenience store. Based on this and on fragments of the physical descriptions of the suspects, Wilson suspected Brown and Johnson were involved in the incident. Wilson backed up to pass Brown and Johnson again and swung his vehicle perpendicular to the road, blocking traffic and cutting off the two young men. As Wilson swung open his door, it either bounced off of Brown and Johnson or was intentionally slammed shut by Brown. Brown and Wilson struggled through the driver's side window. It's unclear whether Wilson grabbed Brown through the window or Brown attacked Wilson through the window. Wilson alleged that in the struggle, Brown hit him in the head twice and that he feared Brown could overpower him and kill him. Wilson unholstered his gun and fired twice. Wilson said he could not not, Wilson said he couldn't access less lethal weapons in his seated position. One shot grazed Brown's right thumb. Brown fled, running east on Canfield. Wilson chased him on foot. Brown got about 180 feet from the police car and turned to face Wilson. Wilson alleged that Brown ran toward him and that he defied Wilson's orders multiple times to stop and get on the ground. Witness accounts, audio recordings, and forensic evidence indicate that Wilson fired 10 shots in three volleys, which comports with, but does not prove, Wilson's claim that Brown advanced toward him three times and that he fired each time Brown continued forward. The forensic evidence is inconclusive on whether Brown was advancing aggressively or in an act of surrender. On this crucial point, there are conflicting witness statements. According to autopsy reports, Brown was shot six to eight times and was ultimately killed by a shot to the apex of the head. On November 25, 2014, the St. Louis County Grand Jury found no probable cause exists to file any charges against Darren Wilson and did not indict him in connection with the shooting of Michael Brown. On March 4, on March 4, 2015, the Justice Department found that the physical evidence and, quote, credible witnesses supported, supported Wilson's version of what occurred. The killing, quote, did not involve prosec- prosecutable conduct on the part of Wilson for civil rights charges. Also on March 4, 2015, the Justice Department uh, released a scathing report on the Ferguson Police Department. The report found that Ferguson officers target African Americans, stop and search people without reasonable suspicion, arrest people without probable cause, abuse their authority to quash protests, routinely ignore civil rights and use excessive force by unnecessarily using dogs, batons, and tasers. I better pause for some water. Oh, thank you.
<clears throat> Within the first couple of weeks after Brown's death, there were news reports that Wilson claimed that Michael Brown had reached for his gun inside the police car. In the grand jury testimony, which was subsequently released in November of 2014, Wilson said, quote, he immediately grabs my gun and says, you're too much of a pussy to shoot me. I thought of the letter from the Justice Department to Melva Duxworth where it said, according to Officer Kelly, he drew his gun and fired a warning shot into the ground because Corporal Duxworth used a judo strike on him. Officer Kelly claimed further that Corporal Duxworth said something to the effect of, that's no good, and tried to grab Officer Kelly's gun. It was then that Officer Kelly fired the fatal shot at Corporal Duxworth. This was deja vu for me, not just, because, not just in the images of Michael Brown and Roman Duxworth each supposedly grabbing for a white policeman's gun, but also in the hypermasculine representations of both black men. To the police, in both cases, the black men were taunting rather than fearful of being shot and killed. Duxworth, a bit more cool and aloof, that's no good. Brown, a bit more bullying, you are too much of a pussy. Wilson's testimony went further with these stereotypes. Wilson said he shot Brown at least, at least once in the first rally of shots, but Brown kept advancing, so Wilson fired another rally of shots and hit Brown at least once again. Wilson said he saw Brown's body, quote, jerk or flinch with each rally of shots. Though Wilson believed he had shot Brown at least twice, the police officer still feared that Brown could overpower him and kill him. Wilson said at this point, um, it looked, uh, quote, at this point, it looked like he was almost bulking up to run through the shots, like it was making him mad that I was shooting at him. And the face that he was looking, and, and the face that he had was looking straight through me, like I wasn't even there. I wasn't even in his way. Jamel Bowie in Slate Magazine observed that Wilson's characterizations of Brown evoke the black brute, quote, a stock figure of white supremacist rhetoric in the lynching era of the late 19th and 20th centuries. And here's a, an extensive couple paragraphs from, um, from Bowie's piece on this. Uh, to the white public, the black brute was a menacing, powerful creature who could, who could withstand the worst punishment. Likewise, in northern papers, it was easy to find stories of giant Negroes who spread terror and rampaged through urban centers. The idea that Brown could resist bullets is also familiar, um, Bowie continues, uh, citing some other research. He says, in a, research, in a recent paper, researchers found that whites are more likely to attribute superhuman abilities like enhanced strength and endurance to blacks than any other group. That, the authors assert, might explain some of the white tolerance for police brutality. Perhaps people assume that blacks possess extra, i.e. superhuman strength, which enables them to endure violence more easily than other humans. And this is also how Mississippi authorities characterize Roman Duxworth. The Smith County Sheriff Ed Martin said William Kelly struck Duxworth several times with his blackjack, but it didn't seem to phase him. The Ferguson grand jury did not need proof um, that there was an actual threat when, when Darren Wilson used deadly force against Michael Brown. The standard, the standard for use of deadly force based on two U.S. Supreme Court rulings is that, that a, the police officer must have uh, a, quote, objectively reasonable belief that there is a threat. Wilson's version of what happened is, quote, consistent with forensic evidence and eyewitness testimony, as Jamel Bowie has noted. It was credible enough for a grand jury to defer to police discretion and decline charges, but the fact that it's possible doesn't make it believable, Bowie wrote. Both the Michael Brown and Roman Duxworth cases involve confrontations with police that escalate to a point where the police officers could plausibly have had, quote, objectively reasonable beliefs that there was a threat that had to be met with deadly force. The black brute stereotype helps to explain how the implicit bias of these police officers, poorly trained in de-escalation tactics, drives such consequential and deadly decisions in the split seconds that police have to judge and act. A 2015 survey by the Police Executive Research Forum found that police cadets typically receive 58 hours of training in firearms, 49 in defensive tactics, 10 in communication skills, and 8 in de-escalation tactics. Jonathan Fenderson, an African-American studies professor at Wash U in St. Louis, told the New Yorker's Jake Halperin that, quote, young black men are inclined to see the police as an occupying force. When Wilson swung his vehicle in front of Brown and Johnson, Fenderson contends, he was sending a message that, quote, you will defer to the power that I exhibit or I am going to force you back into place. 
In the weeks and months following the killing, images and video of the alleged robbery by Brown and Johnson flooded news broadcasts such as this one from the first week after the killing. Breaking news. Photographs coming from the police report have been released. Look at these. Allegedly, they show teenager Michael Brown threatening a store clerk over a pack of cheap cigars. This would have been just before officers got a 911 call about a robbery there. Here are the facts. Brown was six foot four, about 290 pounds. Again, there was a description for someone about that size wearing a red ball cap. Police today also naming Officer Darren Wilson, a six-year veteran of the police force, as the officer who responded to that call. Our Mike Tobin is live in Ferguson, Missouri with the very latest. Mike, bring us up to speed. And Harris, keep in mind the information released goes beyond saying that, uh, whoops, we've got an earpiece problem. Uh, keep in mind the information that was released goes beyond saying that uh, Michael Brown fit the description of someone involved in that, uh, in that strong armed robbery. The information released, according to those incidents reports, Michael Brown was the suspect in that strong arm armed robbery. And that is complemented by, complemented by pictures released with video surveillance that shows Michael Brown standing over this uh, convenience store owner uh, considerably, roughing him up a bit. By roughing him up a bit, I mean he shoved him out of the way. Uh, and this was all in the, in the process of stealing a, a pack of cigars, or a few packs of cigars, Swisher Seat Sweet Cigars, the total value less than $50. It's also interesting to note that with these incident reports, um, an individual named Johnson was named. If you remember one of the star witnesses thus far who said that Michael Brown was just minding his own business when he was gunned down in cold blood, his last name is Johnson. So what we've seen here is an identification of Michael Brown as a suspect, motivation for why he was stopped, and a change of the narrative from the idea that Michael Brown was just minding his own business when he was gunned down in cold blood. Also the development we have today, as you mentioned, is the name of that officer, Darren Wilson, six-year veteran of the force with no disciplinary problems in his past, according to the chief when he gave that description. Also, what we got from the chief from the chief is a reiteration, if you will, of what we heard earlier, that there was a physical altercation, and through the course of that physical altercation, the officer was injured, and all of that led up to the shooting. Now, here's the chief. The officer that was involved in the shooting of uh, Michael Brown was Darren Wilson. He's been a police officer for six years. Has had no, uh, no disciplinary action taken against him. He was treated for injuries which occurred... So um, the news broadcast paints Brown as, as violent, a, quote, suspect in that strong-arm robbery, and Darren Wilson as a, quote, six-year veteran of the force with no disciplinary problems in his past. <clears throat> this is quite different from what Wilson actually understood about the alleged robbery at the time of his confrontation with Brown and Johnson. <clears throat> it also overlooks how Brown and Johnson could reasonably expect violence or other abuse from Wilson. Before the grand jury... Darren Wilson explained that he heard. Uh, Darren Wilson explained that he heard a call over his radio regarding quote a stealing in progress at the local market on West Florissant. I didn't hear the entire call. I was on my portable radio, which isn't exactly the best. I did hear that a suspect was wearing a black shirt and that a box of cigarillos was stolen. After his initial exchange with Brown and Johnson, Wilson said, "When I start looking." Quote, when I start looking at Brown, first thing I notice is in his right hand. His hand is full of cigarillos. And that's when it clicked for me because I now saw the cigarillos. I looked in my mirror. I did a double check that Johnson was wearing a black shirt. These are the two from the stealing. Wilson knew uh, only minimal details. A stealing, two suspects, one in a black shirt, a box of cigarillos. After the fact, the leaked surveillance video footage showed Brown getting physical with someone at the convenience store. But Wilson knew nothing of this. As far as Wilson knew at the time, Brown and Johnson were jaywalking, shoplifting suspects who mouthed off to him. To Brown and Johnson, Wilson was an inherently threatening presence as part of the Ferguson police. To understand how Ferguson residents experienced police, Consider these findings from the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division's investigation of the Ferguson Police Department. I'm going to read two paragraphs from the report in full. 
Patrol assignments and schedules are geared toward aggressive enforcement of Ferguson's municipal code, with insufficient thought given to whether enforcement strategies promote public safety or unnecessarily undermine community trust and cooperation. Officer evaluations and promotions depend to an inordinate, inordinate degree on productivity, meaning the number of citations issued. Partly as a consequence of city and FBD priorities, many officers appear to see some residents, especially those who live in Ferguson's prominently African-American neighborhoods, less as constituents to be protected than as potential offenders and sources of revenue. This culture, this is continuing in the report, this culture within the FPD uh, influences officer activities in all areas of policing beyond just ticketing. Officers expect and demand compliance even when they lack legal authority. They are inclined to interpret the exercise of free speech, uh, of free speech rights as unlawful disobedience, innocent movements as physical threats, indications of mental or physical illness as belligerence. The result is a pattern of stops without reasonable suspicion and arrests without probable cause and violation of the Fourth Amendment, infringement on free expression as well as retaliation for protected expression and violation of the First Amendment, and excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment. Later in the report discussing use of force by Ferguson police, the Justice Department found that the officers, quote, make no attempt to slow situations down, creating time to resolve the situation with lesser force. They act as if every offender has a gun, justifying their decisions based on what might be possible rather than what the facts indicate is likely. Before the 2015 Ferguson report was issued, the unlawful conduct by police was an undocumented reality, nonetheless keenly felt by Ferguson blacks. For Ferguson's blacks, every encounter with police carried the potential financial consequences of municipal fines, often disastrous in their own right and the potential physical and psychological consequences of brutal and degrading treatment. Numerous news reports and commentaries like the one we just watched advance a false narrative of Darren Wilson approaching two young men whom he supposedly knew to be dangerous, violent robbers. In fact, it was Brandon Johnson who had a legitimate basis on which to view Wilson or any member of the Ferguson police as threatening. In the Duxworth case, it's difficult to arrive at any credible reason for Kelly to have arrested a man who had fallen asleep on the bus. Even if Duxworth act was actually drunk and for that reason hard to wake, Kelly's move to arrest him seems dubious at best. Neither the NAACP nor military police in 1962, nor the SPLC in 1989, nor the FBI from 2008 to 2010 interviewed Roman Duxworth's nephew, Odell, whom you saw earlier, telling of how he ended up holding his uncle as he died in the street at the bus station. Odell was identified as an eyewitness, as an eyewitness in, a Jet magazine article, in a Jet magazine article from 1962. So um, this is a page from a different article from Jet, uh, written by the journalist Larry Still, black journalist who wrote for Jet. Um, it's a very important article about the Duxworth case. It was uh, definitely um, one of the initial sources that I was able to draw on as I dug into it myself. And um, there's a picture of Odell on the left, and the caption reads, Nephew Odell was the first to reach dying GI as crowd watched. On same day, victim's wife gave birth to sixth child. And of course, that's Melva Duxworth with um, the first five of their children. If they had interviewed, if, if any of these folks who looked at the case had interviewed Odell, um, it could have led to a very different understanding of the hearsay allegation that Roman Duxworth reached for William Kelly's gun. In this clip, which I'm going to show you, um, it may sound like I'm leading Odell, um, but actually I'm clarifying my understanding from things he's already said earlier in the interview. It's just that it all is, uh, you can get it in a quicker hit on, on, on this clip. No, I've come, I've come, I've come to town to pick him up. Oh, I see. And then my mother, my mother was with me. Who was your mother? Vera Duxworth, but she did not. I'm sorry, what's her name? Vera Duxworth. Vera Duxworth. And she was with me. So she, she, um, so she was, um, Roman Duxworth's sister-in-law? Your father right. was his, was yeah. his brother? Yeah. Okay. And she was with me. But, after then, so, so you, so you got stopped at the red light, and while you were stopped at the red light, you could see the whole thing happening. And, um, and then by the time you came through, 
your uncle was already lying on the ground yeah, shot. Yeah. And were there still other people around? Yeah. Oh, you people yeah. around. Yeah. Like the passengers, the police officer. Yeah. And um, and then you said that um, you were quick tempered. Um, what did you do? I didn't quite. Did you say you grabbed the, for the police officer's gun? So, was he meaning, was his gun back in his holster? Was he still holding it in his hand? What? He had been in his holster. So he, he had shot, um, he had fired uh, from, I know from the, I understand from the reports, he fired twice, once and went into the ground and once uh, right into your uncle's heart. Yeah, right. And um, so then he, he fired and then he, sometime thereafter, he holstered the gun. So yeah. he was then just standing there next to yeah, the body. Yeah, to the body. And um, and you and you like at a kind of anger, you you reached for the gun. Um, and and um, what happened there in that exchange where you reached for the gun? My mother jumped in front of. Wow. And uh, what did Officer Kelly say to you? He, to he, he didn't say nothing. How was he acting? He, you know, he's strange. And he just shook me and I wish I wish that never happened. Wish, you know what they say, what crazy happened to you. Mm. Mm. And no. Uh, but and what I did again, my mother jumped in front of me, I thought it was just little crap. You threw the pistol. So you actually got the gun in your hand? Yeah. Because Kelly was kind of he kind of lost it. Lost yeah. it. He yeah. wasn't. He wasn't with it anymore. Yeah, he wasn't he was in shot or something. Right. And so you grabbed his gun, and your mother made you drop it on the ground. The reason why no, I no witnesses reported seeing Roman Ducksworth grab Kelly's gun may be that it was actually Odell Ducksworth who grabbed Kelly's gun. According to Odell, Kelly was in a decompensated state immediately after the shooting. If Kelly ever told Sheriff Martin or others that Roman reached for his gun, Kelly's memories may have simply been distorted by his mental state in the shooting's aftermath. The closure that the Justice Department purports to provide for victims' family in civil rights era cold cases must include transparency about what was and what was not done in the past and in the present, and about what is truly known and what is not known. The official findings would necessarily include, uh, in Roman Duxworth's case, that the site of the shooting was not secured as a crime scene. No forensic evidence was collected, and the 1962 FBI report could not be found. A failure to address past uh, racial violence contributes to the suffering of victims' families. The persistence of these failures sends the message to all black victims of racial violence, past and present, that the justice system does not include them. Journalism, legal advocacy, memorialization, and activism, including grassroots restorative justice efforts, are the vital instruments we have at our disposal to move towards peace, reconciliation, and what Charles Hamilton Houston once called the, quote, courage to enforce the written law for all Americans. To more fully right these wrongs, however, I believe we need mechanisms of what I've begun to call reparative justice. This is not a call for, for financial reparations, though I, I do support those. Uh, in, in my use of it, Reparative justice uh, would be a means of imposing new investigative protocols and transparency standards on racial killings. Reparative justice would impose a holistic investigative protocol led by a special prosecutor who would uphold standards of truth-telling and accountability ahead of the jurisdictional constraints of existing local, state, and federal agencies. Truth and lines of accountability would not have to be refracted through uncoordinated state and federal investigations and a civil suit, as we've done today for Michael Brown. If transparency was an understood condition of investigation, it would be harder to overlook evidence and ignore leads, such as the known witnesses and readily available investigative data, as in the Roman Ducksworth case. Victims' families could finally be assured meaningful closure. So thank you. So I know people may need to go. Um, this is your lunch break. Um, I'm, I've been told that we actually can have this room for another little while. So if people want to stick around and ask questions, I'm happy to uh, have some discussion. Um, there's my contact information. I'm also, if anyone wants to 
discuss anything about this presentation or my work um, outside of today, um, feel free to get in touch with me. I, I will respond. Um, I do have a, uh, my wife and I had a new, I had a baby a month ago. Uh, um, so um, if I don't respond right away, it's not um, out of <laughs> malice or disinterest, but uh, I promise I will get back to you if, if you contact me. Thanks. Um, any questions or comments? Uh, yes, sir. Um, I just uh, read about both of these cases 15 minutes before I got here online, whatever I could find. And I'm sorry, I'm just curious about you know what do you what do you think of Wikipedia? Because when you look at Wikipedia for for uh, what's um, Mr. Brown, it's pretty interesting details, a lot of detail, including a lot of the actual testimony. Mm -hmm. um, and it certainly, you know, puts a lot of questions in your mind about what, again, really happened. So I, I'm wondering about that. And I also, I don't know, I just have a little concern about interviewing anybody 65, I mean, 60 years later, about something they saw when they were five years old. I don't know, it just, it just struck me. I mean, I read, I didn't, I learned a little bit in 15 minutes ago before I come in here about that. I never knew anything about it at all. But I don't know, I just, you know, I've got kids and grandchildren close to five, one of them, and uh, I just can't see interviewing somebody like that, asking that level of detail and expecting I'm going to get the truth, which I think is hugely important, which is why I'm here. I think that, and that's why I read the Wikipedia too, thing too. And again, the testimony that's there is pretty, I'll just say interesting, to put it mildly. Uh, so uh, let me address your second question first because I, I just need to clarify before, so we don't muddy the water here. Uh, the five-year-old in the story is Roman Duxworth's son, Cordero, um, who, is, uh, who is not on video here. The, the gentleman who was interviewed was Roman Duxworth's nephew, who uh, uh, was in his 20s. Um, he, was a, he was a grown man. Oh, so, so, okay, I'm sorry. So he was the one that was on site. That's right. The 20 year Th that's right. So, um, so I, I don't, I don't want um, there to be any misunderstanding. Uh, I, would, I certainly would wonder what a five-year-old exactly remembered about an incident like that. But, uh, but it, that, that's okay. And as far as Wikipedia goes, I mean, um, I certainly look at Wikipedia when I'm researching any, anything. And often what's most interesting to me are the sources and the footnotes. I don't necessarily assume that it's an authoritative uh, treatment of the matter. But it often, there's often valuable information that you need to test against other information. Um, other questions? Oh, hi there. Hi. Um, do you know? Oh, thank you. Was the bus driver? Um, did the bus driver uh, try to wake Roman Duxworth, or it Im immediately call the police? Did, did any of the other passengers try to wake him? Were all the other passengers white? Was the bus driver white or black? And mm -hmm. what role did all of that play? Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. I, there's I um, there's I, if you're interested, I have a more detailed telling of the story that's um, on the NPR Code Switch site. Um, but um, just to in short, to your specific question, um, yes, the bus driver reportedly did try to wake Duxworth. He shook him, it's uh, shook him or hit him or, or 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 jostled him in some way and couldn't wake him up. Um, and then called the police officer, who also reportedly was physical with him, shaking him or, or slapping him, depending on different um, witness accounts. Um, so um, everyone on the bus was white except for one other passenger. Um, the one named is Mrs. Ossie Ray Brown. I, don't, I think Ossie is her husband's name. Um, I don't know whether she's alive or dead, and either just the Justice Department, um, although I've made some efforts to try to find her. Um, so um, that's, that, that's what occurred. Uh, David. So, uh, first of all, thank you. I mean, it's, really, it's great. Um, you know, I wanted to come back to this question about the NAACP and the Freedom Rider kind of uh, projection. And, uh, you know, th there's another 
question that arises, though, as to whether or not the office, regardless of whether, was, whether or not the officer ha had been tainted by this understanding of freedom riders and whether mm -hmm. you know, it's conceivable that, that, that his attitude was that that's who this must be. or kind of, So kind of, I'm, I'm curious about whether there had been freedom riders in this town mm -hmm. uh, and whether there was any likely exposure to the publicity around the freedom riders that the officer might have been affected by. Uh, sure, I think my um, so um, I'm not aware of there having been freedom riders in the town, um, but I, I haven't tried to research that exact question, so it's possible that there were, but I, I, I tend to doubt it because it's a small town, um, and it was not one where there's, you know, kind of recorded freedom rider incidents. Um, and I think, the, I think the question that you raise is sort of the question that, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, I think, is entertaining when they when they tell the story in the way that they do. Um, I've looked at what um, William Kelly said to the military police about the incident and what the bus driver said to the police about the incident, and there there is no there. I mean, I think I think I mean you you could look at it a little bit cynically and say they're trying to avoid the appearance of a civil rights violation, and that that may influence the nature of what they say, but. To my, to my judgment, their, um, the things that they said about what occurred, uh, really, it was, more, it was much more of an incident like the Michael Brown incident. And that's really one of the things that has been important to me in looking at a number of the racial, racial killings that I've been looking at from the 50s and 60s, that there are a lot of incidents like this one where um, there really is no sort of overlay of civil rights activism involved, that it's about black people being in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, ups, you know, kind of in some way upsetting or justify or, or, or um, upsetting or, um, you know, um, the authority of a, of a white person who has, pa who has the power to kill them. And, um, and I, there, there are many stories like this that are I, in some ways less comfortable to discuss, um, I think. I've been told by um, editors of major news magazines that this way of talking about the Roman Duxworth case um, uh, that it shouldn't be compared to, to the Michael Brown case because, uh, of course, there were you know they were targeting civil rights activists back then. But you know we can't really say that it's exactly racism now and that, that it's apples and oranges. And I, and I really don't think it is. I really think it's that there's a continuity um, across time in these kinds of incidents. And uh, one thing, even though it was a misunderstanding, I want to talk about five-year-olds' memories 55 years later. I'm currently writing something. I'm 60. I'm writing things about when I was five. And the beautiful, beautiful part of Google is that I can fact check myself as I write. So I'm writing about things that have been in my memory since five. And then I can Google fact check and find out, yes, in fact, that did happen. So I don't want to, I want to say you can credibly count on, or that's not the word I'm looking for, five-year-olds' accounts of something that happened 55 years ago. Don't discount children. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? So I, I want to uh, give uh, another round of applause to Ben for this really great presentation, and thank you for coming. Thank you. thank you for having me. Really, thank you very much for having me and for your attention. So, I should chip, chime in that uh, <clears throat> as a result of, uh, of his work, we, we did issue a FOIA request for some of these documents and uh, actually have an interest in finding some students to help us look into them. Uh, so I also want to make sure that, that you all know, uh, if you're not on our email list, please get on our email list to learn about things that are coming up. But as you depart, I'd like to tell you a couple of things on, if I can remember them, I haven't written down, on March 29th. Uh, I'm sorry, on March 29th, we'll be screening a film called Tribal Justice, which is about uh, restorative practices in, in Native American law. On April 2nd, we'll be hosting a woman named uh, Linda Gordon, who's written a book on the rise of the KKK in the 20th century. Uh, on April 11th, we'll be hosting Jean Thea Harris, who's written a book about kind of rethinking the uses and abuses of civil rights lore. Uh, and uh, I think we have some other things coming up which if you visit our website or subscribe, you will learn about. One final comment I have to say is I have to give my thanks and praise to Kelly Garvin, 
uh, who actually came in uh, for a change, uh, who, who actually makes all these things happen, and who does the poster. And I think on this particular poster, she did an incredible job. So we should give her some thanks. Thanks, Kelly. So Ben, again, thank you so thank much. Thank you, David. Thank you so much.